Let me start by congratulating you all, assuming as I do that you participated in elections, some of you, and that you are elected, and also aware that some of you have been appointed to serve as ministers in the new administration. Congratulations. And also permit me to thank uh, the Office of the Prime Minister for inviting me to share my thoughts with you on a subject that I think is very important not only to the federal government of Ethiopia but to the people of Ethiopia and by extension the continent of Africa. My presentation has been summarized in writing and will be available for your reference later. Let me start by saying that the subject of Pan-Africanism is one that remains as important today as it was in my view many years ago. Those of you who are familiar with the struggle for Pan-Africanism will remember its story, particularly through the activities of Africans in the diaspora. You'll particularly remember that prior to the much more famous meeting held in 1945 in Manchester in the United Kingdom, Africans in the diaspora, particularly in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago, in Jamaica, were very particular about having connection with the continent of Africa. You'll remember that they had many meetings, and you'll be familiar with some of the names such as Sylvester Williams from Trinidad and Tobago, such as Marcus Garvey and his call for Africans to go back to the mother continent. And you will also remember African-Americans such as W.B.E. Dubois, who was very active in the process of liberating uh, the African Americans from the clutches of slavery and discrimination, and who also pay played a very critical part in the struggle for decolonization, culminating in the 1945 meeting which for the first time was attended by Africans who later played a critical role in the struggle for decolonization. Of course, Ethiopia does stand out to the extent that it was never successfully colonized. There was limited occupation, and you are familiar with that history. Therefore, it is not mine to educate you on your own history, but you are familiar with it. But it must concern us, particularly at this time, and I hope during this conversation I'll be able to demonstrate why in order for us to understand the present, we must understand the past, which will also enable us to have a glimpse on what the future holds. 
And one of the speeches which is seldom referred to is a speech that was delivered in the year 1906, in the month of April, by a South African called Pixley Kaisaka Seme. And it is instructive that Pixley Kaisaka Seme was the first president of the African National Congress when it was founded in 1912. When Pixley Kaisa Kaseme delivered that speech as a student at the University of Columbia, his title was The Regeneration of Africa. And what he was talking about at that time was an Africa that had borne the brunt of slavery and was laboring under the pain of colonization. Pixley Kaisaka Seme reminded his audience on that day that when the European powers assembled in Berlin in 1884 through to 1885, they agreed to divide Africa into spheres of influence for purposes of exploitation so that the Germans had their share. If you remember, the Germans were present in what we now call Namibia. They were present in what we now call Benin, but was then known as Dahomey. They were present in what is now a part of Ghana, which was then the Togoland, the Volta area. The Belgians were present in Rwanda and Urundi, and they were also present in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Italians, to the extent that they could, tried to occupy Ethiopia and Eritrea, and were present in a portion of Somalia. The British were present, of course, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Nyasaland, in Rhodesia, and in Nigeria, and in many other places. The French, of course, were also present. And all these powers, even the Spaniards were present in Equatorial Guinea, as were the Portuguese. And the whole idea was to use the resources, both natural and human, of the African continent, so that the partition of Africa was one that was designed to benefit the European powers. The partition was arbitrary. If you look at the nation states that we now have, or is it states that we now have with many nations in them, every other African country that we are talking about now is struggling to be a state, all of them, without exception, all of them. And this is what is what Pixley Kaisa Kasem was saying. How will we regenerate this continent? And it's instructive that he was talking at a time when the entire continent of Africa was under colonization, excluding Liberia and Ethiopia, all of them. And therefore, when in 1945, Africans were represented in Manchester, Kwame Nkrumah, was present at that meeting. Marcus Garvey was present at that meeting. Jomo Kenyatta was present at that key meeting. Obafemi Owolowo was present at that meeting. The drive was to decolonize Africa. And one of the things that amazes me is that at that time, these individuals did not have the internet, they did not have WhatsApp, they did not have the kind of communication that we have now. But it is amazing 
at how they were communicating. Even air transport was not as it is now. I was just recently reading the activities of one of the greatest Africans who, in my view, ever lived and whom many people do not know about, the great Ghanaian James Eman Squejir Agri, normally referred to as Agri of Africa, and how he traveled from the United States and went to many countries in Africa traveling by sea and talking about why Africa should be united. And that was Pan-Africanism, the Pan-African spirit at that time. Of course, we then went into the era of decolonization. And the spirit again was one which was consistent. You had people from the Caribbean participating in the struggle in that regard. You have people like W.B. Du Bois saying that Africa must be free. A little later, people like Martin Luther King Jr. and people like Malcolm X talking of George Padmore, talking about how Africa should be liberated and we should work with people in the diaspora. And then the agitation was there that we must regain our independence. And famously in 1949, Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah is saying, seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest will be given unto you. And I dare say that the rest has never been given to us. And even if it is coming, it is coming too slowly. But it is instructive that at that time, the spirit was about the continent of Africa. We were conscious, the leaders were conscious that Africa decolonized without unity would remain weak. And of course, Africa is weak. The weakest continent on earth is this continent in which we are, our continent. So the struggle for independence was everywhere across the world, across the, con the continent of Africa. So when on the sixth day of March, Ghana regained her independence as Ghana, it was then Gold Coast. I think the most eloquent and the most passionate warrior for Pan-Africanism was Nkrumah. He said on that day, and again later, that the independence of Ghana means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. And he meant it because when Ghana regained independence in 1957, one year later, Guinea regained her independence. A year later, the French Sudan, or what we now called, we call Mali, regained her independence. They signed a pact to create what they call the African Union. They thought at that time that that would be Africa in her embryonic day. And they invited Patrice Emery Lumumba in 1961, but of course Emery Lumumba was then assassinated in the month of January 1961. And he warned, this is, this is one of the things that, that, that uh, always stands out in my mind. That Nkrumah of all leaders at that time was able to see that if we were not united, we would go nowhere. So in 1958, he summons a meeting in Accra, Ghana, of the then independent African countries and tells them, if we don't unite now, 
the neocolonialist is going to ensure that we remain disunited and we remain small, and they are going to ensure that the neocolonial project continues. In 1961, on the first day of January, again in Casablanca, Morocco, he tells his audience, let us unite now before each one of our leaders beget, begins to get used to power, because power is easy to get used to. You who have been elected will know. Once you become a minister and you, begun, you become used to people saluting you and opening your doors, if it happens for one month, you will find it very difficult if you lose your ministerial position when there is nobody to salute you and to open your doors. That is how attractive power can be. And he warned the people then. But the colonial project was alive and well because as they were meeting in Casablanca, Morocco, there was another group that was meeting in Monrovia in Liberia. That is how Africa started splitting. Creating two groups, the Casablanca group and the Monrovia group. The Casablanca group, which comprised, I think, famously, Kwame Nkrumah was there from Ghana, Gamal Abdel Nasser was there from Egypt, Ahmed Ben Bella was there from Algeria, Medibo Keita was there from Mali. They took the view, unite now. The Monrovia group, comprised of William Tubman at that time, Hempera Hale Selassie was also in the Monrovia group. Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere was in the Monrovia group. They took the view, we want to unite, but gradually. Let, let it be gradual. So that when Emperor Hale Selassie of Ethiopia convenes a meeting in Addis Ababa on the 23rd through to the 25th day of May 1963, there are two groups already. The Pan-African agenda is already being watered down. There is the Casablanca group and there is the Monrovia group. And the creation of the OAU was a product, was a victory for the Monrovia group. And I want you to, the, there were 32 heads of states and government who met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia on the 23rd through to the 25th day of uh, May, the year 1963. And I want you to listen to all of those speeches or the compilation of them. There is a, a compilation of them that was made in the year 9, 2013 when we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Organization of African Unity. And listen to all the speeches and I pick out a speech from the leader of Central African Republic, David Dako. David says, Central African Republic is so small that if we are not a part of an African Union, the French will come again. And they have come again. Mwalimu Nyerere of Tanzania says we are not here in order to remind ourselves of how important unity is. We are here to talk about the unity of Africa. The host Emperor Hale Silasi of Ethiopia says, it is important for us to realize that we must make sacrifice for the future because a disunited Africa will never re realize our potential. But the most passionate speech again was that of Kwame Nkrumah. He tells them, let us not live here with one, without one government, without one army, without one currency and without having chosen a capital. And I propose that the capital of the new Africa either be located in Bangui in Central African Republic or Leopoldville, now Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But I'm open to any other suggestion. And let us leave here once we have put together a council of foreign ministers in order to begin to work towards an African Union. That is Kwame Nukuruma. Nobody listened to him. We ended up with the OAU. And the story of the OAU can be told and retold. 
Some say that it was a toothless bulldog. Others say that it was not even a dog. But whatever it was, it cannot be denied that it made a contribution to the process of decolonization of the continent in many ways, complete with the establishment of the liberation unit of it, which was headquartered in Dar es Salaam in the, United, in the United Republic of Tanzania, which was spearheaded the decolonization of quite a number of countries at that time. But the point that I'm making is that the pan-African spirit at that time was about a united Africa. Because you will remember at that time that France never wanted to leave and has never left. It is always instructive that when the French left, they formed an organization called Organization for French-speaking countries. The British also created their own commonwealth of independent nations. But what is instructive is that the queen is always the head of those independent nations. I've never understood that. Perhaps the presidents do. The Portuguese, of course, you know, never left easily. Until 1980, when I was an adult, they were still fighting in Mozambique, in Cape Verde, in Guinea-Bissau, in Angola, and in Mozambique. The apartheid regime, of course, only left in 1994, and I wonder whether they have left. That is Africa for you. So that the fears of Kwame Nkrumah that if you are not united, we would have problems started haunting us. He said that if we are not united in the pan-African spirit, what is going to happen is that the imperialist is going to control us. They are going to emphasize our ethnic differences. And they are going to ensure that we begin fighting amongst one another. And as we do so, they are going to exploit us. And they started. In January 1961, they assassinated Patrice Emery Lumumba, and Congo has never been the same again. In 1963, they assassinated Silvanus Olympio in Togo, and Togo has never been the same again. Then there were coup d'etats, Kwame Nkrumah himself. In 1966, eliminated via coup d'etat all his writings, all his speeches burned, never to be read, never to be listened to until 1972 when Ignatius Kutua Chempong rehabilitated him. Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria gone. In Nigeria, Namdi Azikiwe and Abubakar Tafawa Balewa gone. In Mali, Modibo Keita gone. In Chad, everywhere, coup d'etats. Here in Ethiopia, 1974, if I'm not wrong, coup d'etat and the emergence of the Deg regime. In East Africa, Uganda coup d'etat, mutinies in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania in 1971. All orchestrated because we were disunited and we were weak. The predictions of our forefathers and founding mothers that disunited we would remain weak came true. That is the history of it. So that today, when we talk about the African continent and we talk about Pan-Africanism, we must understand it in the context of that history. And you will remember that it is not as if Africa never realized or never recognized that our weakness would be in our disunity, we did. 
We did. Because regionally we were trying to integrate. We were in the East African community, we were creating the East African community. In South Africa, we were creating SADAC. In West Africa, we were creating ECOWAS. In Central Africa, we were creating the organization of Central African communities. In the North, we were creating the Maghreb. Even in this region, we were converting IGAD into something in the nature of an economic community. We were creating COMESA. We were aware that Africa could only operate and operate meaningfully if we were integrated. We are not trading with one another. Intra-African trade is not anything beyond 15%, the lowest anywhere in the world. If you look at all our sectors and look at them, look at our agriculture, almost all African countries are net food importers. There is not a single African country that is in meaningful technology. Not a single African country produces a mobile phone. Yet the single most important ingredient in mobile telephony is to be found in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Not a single African country produces a car other than assembling completely knocked down kits. There is no meaningful production of pharmaceutical products in Africa. And if there was any doubt, COVID exposed it. All African countries, the 55 of them, are waiting to either receive Sinovac from China, Sputnik from Russia, AstraZeneca, Johnson or Moderna. And we don't even know what they are because our bureaus of standardization don't know. If you ask the Ethiopian Bureau of Standards what they are asking us to be injected with, they do not know. They just believe it is a vaccine because the Americans have said so or because the Chinese have said so. Africa is weak. So that even this magnificent edifice, I suspect, has not been erected by Ethiopian engineers. When I see the signage in Chinese, I suspect it is the Chinese. That is how weak we are. That is the reality of our mother continent. It is because we are politically weak, we are economically weak, socially we are disorganized, culturally and spiritually we are confused. That is the continent in which we are today. And the question therefore, what would we do continentally in terms of trade? In 1980, under the Lagos Plan of Action, and some of you have been ambassadors, some of you are, you are now serving cabinet ministers, you will grapple with this on a daily basis. Under the Lagos Plan of Action, Africa sat down in Lagos and said, we are going to improve trade amongst ourselves. 1980, Lagos Plan of Action. Did we do it? No, we did not do it. We did not do it because the European Union was instead engaging us under the African Caribbean, the Lomé Convention of 1975, or the Cotonou Convention of 2000. Africa remains the only continent which is described as Anglophone. So in Kenya or Uganda, we are possibly only 20% speak the English language, we are Anglophone. In French, former French colonies, they are Francophone. In former Portuguese colonies, they are 
Lucifer. In some Arab countries, they are Arabophone. That is who we are. So, when the OAU met in 2013, they asked the question, what happened to the Pan-African spirit? And when, therefore, they met in Sirte, in Libya, under the tutelage at that time of Muammar al-Gaddafi, it was resolved in 1999 that the OAU be renamed and be referred to as the African Union, and it was relaunched, launched, as you know, in Durban, South Africa in the year 2000. But one of the most important things on the, in the 20, uh, 2013 was the speech of the then chairman of the OAU Council, Kosazan Adlamini Zuma, here in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And I want you to read that letter, which I'll paraphrase, in which she writes an imaginary letter to Kwame Nkrumah. He tells and apologizes to Kwame, telling Kwame, we apologize to you because we did not listen to you. We are weak because we did not listen to you. We are divided into 54, 55, depending on whether the Moroccans agree that Saharawi is a country. Nobody cares about us. And brothers and sisters, if you want to know how weak we are, and we are weak, look at how we are treated. Last month, the world met in New York. the General Assembly. When African heads of states and government are speaking, the hall is empty. Nobody bothers because they are saying nothing. And even if they are saying something, it is something that can be ignored. Compare when an African head of state and government is speaking and when the Prime Minister of Little Israel is speaking. They will listen because we are weak and disunited. So we have a weak continent because the spirit of Pan-Africanism disappeared. So the question that we can ask what is the state of Pan-Africanism as we speak today? The African Union, which is weak, says the right things and does the wrong things nine out of ten times. And what are the critical areas in which we are weak? We are weak politically because nobody listens to us. On the third day of March, 1900, on the sixth day of March, 1997, Mwalimu Julius Kambarage of Tanzania speaking in Accra, Ghana, on the occasion of the 40th, 40th anniversary of the independence of Ghana said, the speech is entitled, We Unite or We Perish. And Mwalimu says, I want to apologize to Kwame Nukuruma. Those of us who believed in gradualism were wrong, Nukuruma was right. But Nkrumah also did not appreciate the level of suspicion that existed amongst the leaders at that time. Our generation, he says, fought for the liberation of Africa. 
It is the duty of the new generation to carry the torch forward. He says in his plea, he says that I do not believe that the tribe can be the basis of mobilization in Africa. And he said that as I travel along across the world, people do not care about our Tanzanianness or our Ghanaianness or our Kenyanness or our Ethiopianness. In their eyes, we are all Africans. And perhaps that is what we should use as the building block in order to talk about African unity. But we are not being naive about that unity. Because sometimes when we talk about Pan-Africanism and about African unity, people think we are being too simplistic about it. No, it is not being simplistic and being naive. It is recognizing that as long as we remain the way we are, then Africa in the next 25 years will be recolonized. You know, what is the state of Africa as I speak now? What is the state of our, your continent as we speak now? Because of our disunity, because when we are disunited, then it is good for Europe and America. Look at the state of your continent as I speak. Conflicts of one kind or another. I'll name the countries just for you to know how bad it is, because that is how it is. Go to northern Mozambique. The gas that is there cannot be produced because there is conflict. Northern Mozambique. Go to Somalia, conflict. Here, in your motherland, conflict. Go to South Sudan, conflict. Go to Sudan, conflict. Go to Libya, conflict. Go to Central African Republic, conflict. Go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, conflict. Go to Burkina Faso, conflict. Go to Mali, conflict. Go to Chad, conflict. Go to Niger, conflict. Go to Cameroon, conflict. Go to Nigeria, conflict. Do I go on? That is the state of the continent. So that even when we talk about intercontinental trade, you tell me. Can you drive from Addis Ababa to Dhaka in Senegal? Unless you are daredevil himself. Which group will not kidnap or ambush you? That is the state of the continent because we are weak and disunited. I fly from Nairobi, Kenya for one and a half hours. I come from the shilling zone. I go into the beer. 33 currencies in Africa. 33 currencies. None of which is used to conclude transactions anywhere. I come to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and I show my shilling. They say, what is this? But let me show the dollar. Oh, this is it. Let me show the euro. This is it. 80% of transactions in Africa are concluded outside of the continent in dollars. So you may have the central bank or the federal bank of Ethiopia, or oh, Mickey Mouse. You may have the central bank of Kenya, Mickey Mouse. You may have all these 54 central banks useless because we are not playing in the real league, we are playing in the small league.
That is the state of the continent. So as you have the honor and privilege of serving in the government of Ethiopia and as you think about integration, that is the continent in which you are now weak. That is the state in which we are. I watched a woman from Nigeria who had been rescued from the Mediterranean around Lampedusa saying, I will not go back to Africa. Even if I die in the Mediterranean, I'll try again and again. What is it? that can make a human being say that I do not want to go back to my home. Because the natural instinct of a human being should be that you want to go home. It's because we are weak. Let me conclude by looking at Africa in the future. What is the state of Pan-Africanism? Africa finds herself in a very difficult situation. What Nkrumah feared. Today, many African leaders have gotten used to the trappings of power. And those who speak about power, right, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I remember in 1997, I think, I may be wrong about the year, 1995, I think, I was serving as an intern at the Mwalimu Julius Nyerere Foundation in Dar es Salaam. And I had the privilege and honor of driving with Mwalimu Nyerere in Dar es Salaam. And he had only one guard and a driver. And he stopped at the few traffic lights and only moved when the traffic lights moved. And I asked him, Marimu, what? how did you leave power? He said, oh, when I said I wanted to leave office, there was no shortage of people telling me, don't leave us as orphans. It is very rare to find those in positions of leadership in Africa today who would leave, willingly leave office. Power in Africa is now sought by hook and crook and retained by hook and crook. Because the trappings of power are good. And permit me, when I am gone, even if I irritate you, in fact, perhaps my intention is to irritate you, so that you reflect upon what I'm going to say. And this is a personal thing. I'll give you an example. When I was appointed as the director of the Anti-Corruption Commission, I drove in the morning in my car with my driver. In the evening when I was leaving, there were three cars, mine, what was allocated to me, and another one in front, and another one behind me, and 12 individuals, and I asked, who are these fellows? Say, these are your security. I said, I don't need my security. I don't need two cars, I only need one car. Because this thing you call security, this is spectacle. And throughout the period that I served, I had only one security and one car. And I say this because it is in the nature of power to make you use the things that you don't need. And once you get used to them, then without them, you feel empty and lonely. And you will find them, you'll be told, and many of you will love them, they are good. When doors are open for you, they are good. When you occupy front seats, it is good. 
When you are dressed, your excellency, it is good. When you eat the best food, it is good. When you have security, it is good. But it can also dehumanize you. It can also monsterize you. I am asking you today that part of the problem of Africa is that we found human beings and we monsterize them. Writing in 1983, Nigeria's Chinua Achebe writes in a book which I commend to you, The Trouble with Nigeria, which could as well be The Trouble with Africa. He says, the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. As we look at Africa today, I hope that this administration which has now committed itself to the Pan-African movement will think in that direction. And this bring me, brings me to what I think should be contemporary Pan-Africanism. If you look at the Treaty of the East African Community, the Treaty of the East African Community says that there shall first be a common market, then a common currency and political federation, which ought, which ought to have happened in the year 2010. East Africa community should have had its first president in 2010. That is now 21 years, 10 years later, there is no such thing. In ECOWAS, it ought to have been the same. In SADAC, it ought to have been the same. I hope that with your population of 120 million, because Ethiopia is, is, is an economic powerhouse, potentially. Potentially. You know, Pan-Africanism, the new Pan-Africanism must have an economic component of it. That is how I understand Africa Agenda 2063. Africa Agenda 2063 says that by the year 2063, Africa will, be, will have pulled up her people into a middle-level economy on seven pillars, economically, politically, and otherwise. And the Africa continental free trade area suggests to me that we'll have broken all the tariff and non-tariff barriers. Will we be able to achieve those in the spirit of new Pan-Africanism? Will we have one currency? Will we have one passport? We have already said so under the Kigali agreement that we are going to have one passport. Will we have one telephone code? We have 55 telephone codes. You move from Nairobi 254, you come here, you have another one, you go to Eritrea, Eritrea, you have another one, there is no connectivity in the 21st century. How can you be taken seriously? Those of you in the United States of America, you fly from Boston, Massachusetts to San Francisco in the West, six hours, 40 minutes, the code is one. The tariff is one. The COVID test is one. I moved from Nairobi to Addis Ababa, COVID test. If I don't travel this evening, I'll be subjected to another COVID test. I go to Tanzania, COVID test. Uganda, COVID test. Your nose will begin debating with you. In the United States of America, you take one COVID test from Miami and you don't take it as you go to St. Louis in Missouri. Do you, I'm talking about very practical things. I come here and I have to go through an immigration. My passport has to be stamped. Somebody in the United States of America does not have to do that. Somebody in the European Union across 27 countries does not have to do that. In China, which is, of course, 1.4 billion, does not have to do that. Until we change all those things, we are going nowhere so that we have only one telephone code 
so that we have only one currency, so that we have only a single immigration, so that we eliminate all these armies. You know, you look at some African countries and they have an army, which, which was complete with five-star generals who have never even quelled a street riot, and they are generals. You, your money goes into man, maintaining militaries, maintaining embassies that you don't need. You see how why Africa is poor? All these 55 countries have embassies. If we were one, there would only be one ambassador for Africa in the United States of America. There would only be one army with regional policing. Am I being naive or simplistic? Yes, we can create a single Africa with a loose government, a confederal government. Dealing only with foreign affairs and defense and monetary policy and general policy formulation with different governance systems. That is the only way in which these tribal, narrow tribal instincts will be dampened. But as long as, and now I want to conclude, if we only see Pan-Africanism as sentimentalism, as a romantic idea about which we debate and we remain as we are, then this is the Africa that I see. This is the Africa that I see in 25 years' time. Many Africans, either legally or otherwise, will break into different autonomous countries, many of them. We'll have more than 100 countries in Africa, each claiming self-determination, and is already beginning to happen. Because we will be looking at narrow ethnic agenda as the only way of defining our affairs. Ethiopia will break down, Kenya will break down, Nigeria will break down, South Africa will break down, and look at South Africa. Only last week, the whites in Western Cape in South Africa have delivered a petition to the government in Pretoria saying they want to create their own country. The Democratic Republic of Congo will break down, Libya will break down. The only way in which we can immunize ourselves against all those things is to create a pan-African nation which allows for self-determination within the nation. And we must redefine terms such as self-determination. Self-determination must mean the ability of a people within a bigger unit to enjoy their culture, to enjoy their tradition, to speak their language, they do it on a smaller scale in Switzerland, those of you who are familiar with Switzerland. And we de-emphasize the presidency, we de-emphasize the prime minister's office. Pixley Kaisa Kaseme said, and I conclude with him, Africa is diverse. Some people say that because of our diversity she cannot unite. She can, because unity in diversity is possible if we understand what human beings need. In the nature of things, human beings need security. In the nature of things, human beings need food. Human beings need medical services. They need infrastructure. If you have a government that allows that, he said, then it reminds me of the piano. If you press the black button of the piano, it produces some sound. If you press the white one, it produces some sound. But if you press both the black and the white, it produces melodious music. And I think that the new Pan-Africanism must look to that. And you who have the honor and privilege of thinking and working in government, it is your duty to start that journey. 
It is not going to be easy, but it is an intergenerational journey. Play your part, for it can be done, and it must be done.